Testing, testing. That seems good. Okay. One uh, reminder, after this lecture, there will be a picture taken, so please don't run away. So the picture will be in this area here. So ju just wait a few minutes after the lecture ends so that the picture can be taken. So the lecture now is the first lecture of the black holes and quantum error correction is by Christopher Akers from MIT. Please. Thank you. Um, and thank you to the organizers for putting this together. I'm having a lot of fun um, learning from the other lectures and uh, meeting many of you. And I hope that continues. Uh, and please let me know if this mic isn't picking me up very well. Um, it's kind of just hanging here. So I think my starting place for thinking about this topic is that I have many questions about quantum gravity um, that I would like to see answered. And you know, some of these questions are like, what happens near singularities and black holes? Uh, do black holes or generic state black holes have firewalls? How is space-time emergent in quantum gravity? Because that's a thing that seems to happen, et cetera. And one route to getting answers to these questions seems to be ADS-CFT. Uh, this famous duality, which I'll say more about momentarily, but um, yeah, the idea is that you have some quantum gravity theory in some d plus one dimensional space time, uh, and it's dual to some quantum mechanical theory in one fewer dimensions. And the idea is that, you know, in principle, we understand the CFT, maybe in practice it's difficult to compute things. Um, but at least because we in principle understand this side and there's a relationship between them, we have a route to getting answers to the questions that we said momentarily uh, just a bit ago. And the route is this three-step process. So you could say, all right, I have some question, like does this black hole have a firewall? And I can just formulate this question in gravity, so on the, on the ADS side. Then I can use the dictionary between the ADS and the CFT to map this question to the CFT. And then after mapping the question to the CFT, I answer it there. So for example, you might have some um, operator near the singularity of a black hole and you want to know what's going on uh, there. So you want to evaluate the expectation value of this operator or something. Uh, so you might imagine you could map that to some operator in the CFT and evaluate the expectation value of that dual CFT operator. And that would allow you to learn something. Um, so that would be the algorithm. So given that you could, in principle, or you know, we have this three-step process that we can lay out, um, why were all of our problems about quantum gravity, at least these that I mentioned, not solved 25 years ago? You know, what's the bottleneck here? Um, and I would say, certainly not one. We have plenty of questions. And uh, I, three isn't the only bottleneck, so you know, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm certainly not going to say that we have the ability to answer any question we want and say n equals four super Yang mills. Um, but it's not like everyone studying quantum gravity is just uh, studying n equals four super Yang mills. Um, you know, there's other things people study. And why is that? And part of the answer is that two is a huge bottleneck. So whenever we formulate this question, like you know, what, uh, what is the expectation value of this operator near the singularity of this black hole, it's actually not clear to us in our current state of knowledge how to do step two. How do you map that to something that you can evaluate in the CFT? Or for example, 
um, and you have some generic state black hole, and you want to evaluate the number operator at its horizon that, that could, in principle, tell you if it has a firewall. Uh, it's not clear how to map that to something to evaluate in the CFT. Um, so this program that exists uh, for basically fixing this bottleneck, understanding the map to the CFT, is called the bulk reconstruction program. This is the name. So it, it goes by this name because, um, as we'll see momentarily, the ADS often is called the bulk, because it's like the bulk part of this of some cylinder that you might draw. And reconstruction means you're looking at the dual CFT and you're trying to reconstruct the physics of the ADS out of it. That's why it has this name. So it really just means um, understand the ADS CFT map or dictionary. You know, dictionary is in the thing that relates two languages. Okay, so the point of these lectures is to tell you much of what we know about which operators uh, in the ADS can be reconstructed in the CFT and how to do it. And um, as far as the how to do it part, I'll mention a little bit about this. Um, there actually are many reconstruction schemes, but my focus will be less on particular schemes that people have constructed for doing this reconstruction and more on theorems that people have come up with about what is in general possible and not possible to reconstruct about the bulk using the CFT or different parts of the CFT. Okay. So, That's the program. Let me cover some of the ADS CFT basics. So first, the ADS basics. I'll tell you about uh, what do I mean when I say ADS, then what do I mean when I say CFT, and then what's, what do we know about the map relating them. So ADS, right, so really it's um, anti de Sitter, anti de Sitter space. So, in gravity, we care about space-times that are solutions of Einstein's equations, which we could write down, um, but I'm sure you're familiar with them. And ADS, or anti de Sitter space, is the maximally symmetric vacuum solution with uh, lambda equals zero. Oh, sorry, lambda less than zero. Solution of... Einstein's equations with lambda less than zero. And you can write this solution down, this metric, uh, in global coordinates, as they're called. There's many different coordinates you could use, of course. So the, uh, hopefully, this is not a sign that it's too low that I'm sitting now. Um, the metric is this one. I won't use very many details of this metric, or any details really, um, but I'm going to show it to you for the sake of completeness. This is so this is ADS um, I'll say d plus one. So it has d spatial dimensions and then one time dimension. So here, you know, this is time, t. This is r, the radial direction. And then this is the, like, a metric on the sphere, d minus one sphere. And um, this, this l here is, is called the ADS radius 
It's just a characteristic length scale of the space-time, um, sort of analogous to the Hubble radius in our universe. It's related to lambda. So if you plug in some lambda into you know, you're trying to solve Einstein's equations with some cosmological constant that's less than zero. Um, this solves it, where L is related to lambda in a way that's not important enough for me to write it down, but it's like d times d minus 1 over 2 L squared is lambda, where d is the space dimensions. And r runs from 0 to infinity. Time runs from minus infinity to infinity. And I might draw it this way. So this is a very common diagram. And I will draw a number of diagrams that look like this. Um, so this is, I'm really just trying to draw a cylinder where time runs up, r runs outwards. I've suppressed um, the sphere. I mean, it would, it would look like this. So say some time slice, uh, when it hits the boundary of the cylinder, it would look like this circle. Uh, and then time slice would fill in, would be this disk here. And say a, a circle there might look like this. That's a circle in the middle of the bulk. So ADS, So this cylinder is some compactified way of drawing ADS, where there's um, r goes from 0 to infinity all the way out here. So there's actually infinite distance in this diagram. And um, uh, we have not compactified time. So the cylinder, in principle, runs um, all the way to minus infinity and plus infinity. Uh, but space is compact here, or it's drawn compactified. So this is the sort of conformal compactification space. Um, there's some other, there's lots of interesting physics that you can talk about that shows up nicely in this diagram. Won't be very important, so I won't say it. But uh, I will often draw time slices. So for example, this time slice here, I might draw just as a circle. Um, so here, this is the same radial reduction. And in general, we're not going to care just about vacuum ADS. Right? This is a solution where there's this negative cosmological constant, but no matter fields uh, back reacting. <coughs> we will in general care about asymptotically ADS solutions. So these are solutions of Einstein's equations um, that have the same uh, boundary conditions. So they, they limit to this ADS metric at large values of R. And one particularly important asymptotically ADS geometry that we will talk about is what you, is uh, ADS Schwarzschild. So, how do you spell Schwarzschild? It's R Z S child. Someone will laugh at me. I get this wrong. So. Um, okay. And this metric, um, this is just the metric of ADS uh, if you have a black hole in the middle. So this will be an eternal black hole. You can also consider solutions that come from, say, collapsing some uh, ball of dust or a star to form a black hole. Uh, this will be the simplest black hole to talk about. And it has a metric probably very similar to the ones that you're used to, say, in flat space. At this level, it's the same. And f of r. Looks like this. There's this extra term here uh, relative to that solution. Okay, 
guys. So this f of r has these three terms, one plus r squared minus this guy, which includes the mass of the black hole and G Newton, uh, setting various things to one, like h bar and c. Um, I'm going to talk about black holes in ADS at some point, and this is essentially the metric I have in mind. And the, the Penrose diagram for it looks something like this. Um, I won't, I'm going to uh, sort of assume that you've seen Penrose diagrams, uh, the, but essentially what I mean is like over there, time runs up, um, R is outwards. Um, this, these diagonal lines are the horizon. Uh, the horizons of, there's two black holes here connected by a wormhole, so um, let me say it this way. There's two asymptotic boundaries. We'll call a right boundary and a left boundary. And if you take, say, a time slice here, this time slice, rather than being a disk like that, it sort of looks like this slightly deformed cylinder, this topologically a cylinder. Uh, where this is, this circle here is a time slice of the left boundary, and this circle on the, here is a time slice of the right boundary. And the time slice that I've indicated by this line going through the ADS space time is sort of the outside of this tube. So these are some examples of ADS and asymptotically ADS solutions. And we will um, be thinking about states with geometries like these as we go. Um, so far, I've just talked about the metric in these space times. But besides gravity and you know, different metrics, the theory in ADS can also contain matter, which for the purposes of these lectures, at least until later, we'll treat as, so this matter will be treated as quantum field theory living on, say, these curved backgrounds, perturbatively coupled to gravity, which is what we'll call semi-classical gravity. So I'll write it here, uh, just to remind you, we're gonna be working in this, for now, in this uh, semi-classical gravity setting. where matter is essentially treated as some quantum field theory on some backgrounds such as these, uh, perturbatively coupled to the graviton. Okay, so this is what I'll call the ADS basics. Let me tell you the CFT basics, and I'll tell you how they are related. So CFTs are relativistic quantum field theories that have Poincaré invariants, um, but also invariants under two more uh, transformations. So they're also they also have uh, good transformation properties under what's called uh, dilations which transform the coordinates like this. We sort of scale everything by some lambda. And uh, the generator of this, we'll call it D. That's in some operator in the CFT. And then also what's called special conformal transformations, which transform the coordinates like this. The details of this won't matter. Uh, this is another thing I'm writing essentially for completeness. Uh, 
the generator of these transformations we'll call k sub mu. Uh, so these two transformations together, or you know, these generators together with the generators of um, the Poincaré group form a larger group called the conformal group, SOD2. And local, so there's, yeah, so there's a, well, I'll write it down. And uh, local operators transforming and representations of this group satisfy the following equation, which will be important for one part of the talk that I'll tell you right afterwards. So, essentially this equation. So here, uh, this D is the generator of dilations. And this O of X is some local operator transforming in some representation of this conformal group. And so it satisfies this equation. Uh, where this, this delta here is the thing I want to emphasize. So this is called the scaling dimension. And uh, it's something that's assigned to each operator O that satisfies an equation like this. So it can, you know, there's different deltas for different O's. Okay, and so in some sense, this is, these are the CFT basics. I do want to emphasize that CFTs are UV complete because you have this scaling invariance, so you can sort of keep zooming in as far as you want, uh, and it'll you'll you'll have essentially the same you'll have the same CFT. So they're UV complete in this sense, and so there's a sense in which the CFT dual of some uh, semi-classical gravity theory in ADS offers a UV completion of bulk semi-classical gravity. So there's this sense in which you can uh, have semi-classical gravity formulated in the ADS, and we know that the CFT that we're, map we're mapping it into with a dictionary that we'll talk about um, is UV complete, and so in principle, it can give us uh, nice UV complete answers. Okay, so, so that's why uh, again, we care so much about this dictionary. So, moving on from the CFT basics, let's talk about ADS CFT. <clears throat> so, fundamental to this duality is the following statement which is called the extrapolate dictionary. And I, I believe this dictionary was first made explicit in this paper, and uh, which I'll include in some lecture notes, um, by Banks, Douglas, Horwitz, and Martinek in 1998. Um, but this extrapolate dictionary goes something like this. So the, it's, in some sense, the, uh, the starting point for everything, for everything else we're going to talk about. It's like a, a fundamental relationship between ADS operators and CFT operators. So the idea is if you have, let's say, some, let's let phi be some uh, ADS operator acting at some point we'll call um, X1, R. So maybe I'll draw a picture uh, here. No, I'll go over here because I've already drawn it. So the idea is we have some, let me erase this time slice I've drawn just because it's cluttered. So 
I'm looking at this cylinder uh, as, as my picture of ADS. And I want to write down some operator phi at some point uh, x1 comma r. That's this point. So it's acting somewhere in the bulk. And uh, so first, before I even tell you the extrapolate dictionary, let me emphasize that we're thinking about this gravity theory, this ADS theory, uh, living sort of in the cylinder, the, the interior of the cylinder. Uh, the CFT, you should imagine, is living on the boundary of the cylinder. So to emphasize that, I might write it this way. The time slices of this, so the CFT is one fewer spatial dimension, in some sense lacks this radial direction. So a time slice of the CFT, right, might look like this, whereas a time slice of the ADS would be the disk that uh, fills in that circle. And they both share the same uh, time direction in the sense of uh, forward and time up. Okay, so we have this operator phi in the bulk, and maybe uh, this other phi acting at some point x2 r. So I'm isolating this r dependence just because it's going to show up in a special way momentarily in this equation. Uh, but x1 and x2 just denote all the other coordinates. So their placement in time, their placement in the transverse directions, all of that's just lumped into these other coordinates x1, x2, and so on. And I might also have um, phi x3r, and so on. So, so I have some collection of phi here. This is some correlation function. This is x1, that's xn. Uh, I'll write uh, a yes there, or bulk. And I'm going to have them all be the same phi. I'm not, uh, not right now going to have different bulk fields in this correlation function. They're all the same one. Because uh, this is the context in which this uh, extrapolate dictionary is most conveniently stated. And um, what I'm going to do is scale them in this way. So there's r to the minus n delta. Delta is related to this delta. Uh, in a way I'll tell you momentarily. We'll have to write to the right-hand side before that, make, that makes sense. This n is just the number of operators inserted here. And I'm going to take a limit that r goes to infinity. So this is like I have my operators uh, all placed at some radial position r, and then I'm taking a limit where they're all going out to the boundary. Um, or on this time slice diagram, It'll be convenient to draw them sort of like this. Um, these are all phi insertions. And I'm going to consider correlation functions uh, in the limit that all of these are taken out to infinity uh, radially. And the idea, the statement of this dictionary, is that this correlation function in this limit, scaled this way, equals a certain CFT correlation function. And that is, uh, so you have this O of x1. So this x1 is the same one here. So it's the same place in the, in the transverse directions. Uh, there's no r in that O position, of course, because we've taken the limit that r goes to infinity. So all CF, that makes sense. All CFT operators live on the boundary of this cylinder. So they shouldn't have a radial, radial position. And so on for all of them. And this delta here, let me see if I can use a different color. This delta here uh, is the scaling dimension of O over there. This, okay. And uh, part of the statement of the dictionary is that for each bulk phi, there exists some CFT O uh, that satisfies this equation. And this O is called the, the CFT dual 
a five. Or you might call five the ABS dual. Oh. Okay. Um, good. So this is one nice relationship between ADS quantities and CFT quantities. And it, in principle, specifies the duality. But at least in practice, it has a major limitation. And because of this limitation, we're going to have to consider, um, we're going to have to think about the dictionary, you know, the, the map between operators in the Bulkan boundary, a little harder. We're not done just because we know that. So the limitation is that, okay, this is a time slice of ADS. Um, we're again, in the, the circle on the boundary, you might imagine as a time slice of the CFT. If I wanted to, say, evaluate the correlation function of uh, phi's, you know, these bulk operators phi, uh, sitting at the boundary, using the CFT, I could do that. This tells me how to do that. So that's great. Um, but what if I want to do something a little different, and I want to consider so the four-point function of operators phi um, that are not at the boundary but are still sitting at some finite radial distance. This doesn't manifestly tell me how to do that using the CFT. So we're going to have to work a little harder. And people did this. And this limitation, to some extent, was mitigated or figured out, you know, people figured out a way around it in 2006. So all of this, remember, was around 1998, shortly after ADS-CFT um, was written down. People really understood the mapping between certain operators on both sides at the level of, say, this equation. It took until about 2006 for people to start writing down things like the following, which will be called HKLL reconstruction. This is the name that it goes by. And uh, as I said, 2006, by these authors, um, I won't write their, their names down here, but I'll put them in the lecture notes, uh, Hamilton, Kabat, Lipschitz, and Lowe. Um, they wrote a series of good papers uh, about this that I'm about to tell you. Um, but you can also, uh, if you want a pedagogical introduction that goes into more details than I'm about to, uh, you can see Daniel Harlow has some lectures that you can find online from 2018. They're uh, his Tassi lectures. So if you look up Harlow, Tassi, T-I, T-A-S-I, sorry, that's small, um, you can find these. They go into great detail, um, and they're very pedagogical. So the idea behind HKLL reconstruction is that in certain cases, we will be able to evaluate using the CFT um, some, say, four-point function of operators deeper into the bulk. And the idea, in words, is essentially that operators have to solve the equations of motion, which are some partial differential equation. And you can solve these using Green's function methods that have boundary conditions at spatial infinity given by the extrapolate dictionary. So the, the spirit is um, you sort of start with your phi inserted at some finite radial distance in ADS, and you sort of solve the equations of motion out radially to the ADS boundary. And uh, there, 
you know, it'll be some mess of operators, some integral of many operators. But each of those, you can relate to boundary operators, to CFT operators, using this extrapolate dictionary. So this will give you some expression involving Green's functions for these bulk operators in terms of some integral over boundary operators. I and have a question. Like yeah. Yes, uh, perhaps this is a naive question, but um, since in a theory of dynamical gravity, uh, diffeomorphism can be thought as a, a gauge symmetry, mm -hmm. um, I mean, is there some subtlety in defining these operators where the insertions are in the bulk? Uh, yes, absolutely. Can we absolutely consider yes. them as gauge invariant observables? So? Yes, thank you for that question. Yeah, so I, I am, uh, I was being a little fast and loose by what I mean by local operator here. To really define these in a gauge invariant way, uh, I might want to say an operator inserted at some uh, renormalized distance L starting at this point on the boundary and go, yeah, going in this renormalized distance L. Uh, so each of these might be defined uh, in a gauge invariant way like that. And it's these uh, dressed operators that I might try and reconstruct. Um, and it's, it's something, even here, uh, I can't do this using just um, the extrapolate dictionary itself. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. Does it matter how you dress? Yes. Uh, each of these dressed a different way would be a different operator. But there is a, for certain questions, how you dress will be a subleading effect, if that makes sense. Uh, I see. But yeah, so like this is a different operator from, say, this. But um, for many questions that say leading order 1 over g, that difference won't be important. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It is not a question. Oh, yeah. Sorry, uh, can we think this dressing as like a, in usual gauge theories, like electrons uh, attached to Wilson line? Yes, it's the gravitational version of that. Yeah. Um, so the gravitational version is uh, there at the end of some geodesic. Say that's one way to do it. Uh, yeah, there's many ways to do it, but it's exactly morally analogous to that. Yeah. There is maybe a follow-up of the Francesco's question, but. Um, Usually, the statement in gravity is that since uh, local operators uh, essentially does not really make sense, so uh, actual degrees of freedom live on the boundary, typically all the questions that you can ask are answered by, by the correlator of, of the CFT which live on the boundary. So which question um, do you need to ask in order to be interested really in correlators uh, where the points are in the bulk? Good. Um. One example is when, uh, say, you can construct operators that are anchored to points on the boundary and therefore gauge invariant in this sense, but aren't only supported on the boundary. Uh, they come in some finite radial distance. And uh, so like these guys here that I've drawn will be an example. Uh, so even though, yeah, so this, these phi's now, you know, they're all different, phi 1, phi 2 by three, by four, because they're all, they dressed in their own independent way. Um, so I want to compute this correlation function. Um, the gauge theory analog would be like some, uh, th these would all be operators that insert some charge, dr dressed with some Wilson line to the boundary. And um, this will be non-trivial to answer and certainly not possible just using the extrapolate dictionary uh, because they're not completely supported on the boundary. Uh, they have some finite sense of sign. There's other questions that we might ask, which is, I'm going to be very interested in, which I could use this uh, black hole diagram to answer. So um, before I talk about the black hole, actually, let me mention some, some other situation. So let's say, sorry, I'm going to erase this. We just have vacuum ADS. And uh, I want to compute some scattering process. So I maybe insert at the boundary at some early time two particles, like A and B. 
uh, and, they, and the bulk fall in, and then they interact here, and then they come out. Sorry, I drew my cylinder too short, so let me erase it again and then draw it really tall. So that these two guys start at the boundary, fall in, interact, and then um, they come out, maybe in some scattering process, um, ultimately hitting the boundary, perhaps at different places, and uh, I can ask like, you know, about correlation functions of all the operators, uh, of, of operators living just in the boundary. And this would be something I could do using the CFT, uh, even though this process is happening in the bulk, I could ask about the uh, outputs given these inputs using the bulk. And that's all fine. Uh, and this might be something I'm interested in doing, and then I don't really have to do anything more complicated than using the extrapolate dictionary. However, there are other processes, which I am personally interested in, uh, where you can't just, it doesn't, the problem doesn't just reduce to this, even though it's something as simple as scattering. So I could, for example, here, take some operators inserted, now there's a black hole, um, and uh, these two particles inserted at the boundary will fall in, and they'll interact here, which is inside the horizon of this black, these, two, these black holes, uh, and then they'll have outputs, um, which hit the singularity, don't come back out, and I might want to understand what the, what, what the outputs are here, so how the scattering works in this highly, this perhaps highly curved um, regime. And this is not something that I can do using just simple, um, the simple extrapolate dictionary because these guys never come back close to the boundary. So this is another example of the type of thing I would like to be able to answer, but we have to work more on the dictionary to do that. So, is, so sure, um, um, j just to make sure I'm understanding, it is still true that uh, all the, um, all the information of gravity is on the boundary, but uh, uh, there are some processes which are not captured by a simple correlation function of local operator on the boundary. Uh, that appears to be the case, yes. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you, these are great questions. So, as we were saying, uh, this idea behind HKLL reconstruction is that you, you write these phi's, perhaps with their dressing, um, as some uh, sort of smeared out operator on the boundary by using these Green's function methods combined with the extrapolate dictionary. And the answer you get looks something like this. So, so some phi of x, but, but now this is, an operator in the CFT that's supposed to you know, act like phi of x. Um, I'll make that clear if it wasn't clear. Looks like the following. So, so on the right hand side here, uh, this is this is the CFT dual of phi as an operator. So you know the, the O that shows up on the right-hand side when phi is on the left-hand side of the extrapolate dictionary. So those are the O's that go here. And this K is a Green's function where Capital X, you should regard as uh, a boundary point, like a, a point in the CFT manifold. And then little x is like a bulk point. So that's, you know, phi is living at some point. Little x, O is living at some point, capital X. Uh, so we're integrating over a set of boundary points that I'm calling S of x. What are those boundary points? I need to draw a picture for you to explain it. So here again, I'm drawing this ADS cylinder. And let's say we had inserted phi here. So this, this is the point little x. Um, the support, so this region S sub x is some 
patch of the boundary cylinder. That it, it's a patch that is space-like or null, so not time-like to little x. So if you, if you drew the light cone in the bulk from this point, it would hit the boundary somewhere. And uh, so this is supposed to be the, the forward and backwards light cone hitting the boundary at these circles. That's what these circles I drew were trying to, to be. And this region S of X, I'm going to write it in blue, is this region that I'm trying to shade in blue that's like space-like or light-like related to this point X in the bulk. So this is the this is one formula that HKLL has. So I'm gonna write this. So this is the boundary points space like to X. Okay. Um, so, so by this equation, I mean uh, this is some CFT operator, and uh, that it's the CFT operator that's supposed to reconstruct this bulk operator. Sorry, can you say it again? Don't matter. Uh, all uh, all uh, x uh, is belonging to the uh, left conformal theory or right conformal theory. Ah, uh, good. Yes. So um, this good. This is a great question. So b b I'm going to get to the black hole geometry momentarily. Uh, there's actually a subtlety that shows up there, and I, I that's your pre you're, you're already thinking of the right question. Um, for now, imagine this formula in the context of this cylinder where there's one CFT to talk about, and then this O is the uh, some operator in that CFT. Uh, a version of this will work also for the black hole case, but it gets complicated because there's a black hole and there's a singularity, and I want to tell you momentarily how to handle that. Um, so, what's your Green's function? It's a I don't remember the form of it. It's, um, it's not the bulk boundary propagator. I remember that. It's uh, something else. Yeah. Oh, so if you compute the Laplacian of this green function, do you get a, a, so you don't get just a delta function at the boundary? Or, or? Yeah, if you compute the Laplacian, or like take, plug it into the equations of motion, um, you get you're saying because if it was a delta function at the boundary, then that would be the bulk to boundary propagator? No, I don't know what this k uh, is. I'm just, yeah. I think it is the one that's, it, yeah, it solves the equations of motion in that sense. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't remember off the top of my head many properties of this Green's function. I remember it's not the one, it's not the same K that shows up in the in Witten diagrams. Um, it's kind of ugly, yeah. But it, yeah, the explicit form that was a lot of the work that HKLL did. Um, but it won't it won't be important for where I go. Uh, should we think about this identity like an operator equation? I mean that uh, every correlator of, of the phi's uh, is equal to, is, is obtained by the correlator of the CFT using this transformer? Yes, exactly. Um, oh, good. Yeah, let me mention a few caveats about Witten's formula holes. That's exactly what you're getting at. So that, that is the, the idea. Is you, you, this, is a matching, this is an operator equation. But I wrote this in the free field setting. So there, there's some closed form uh, K that you can write down. Uh, when there's interactions in the bulk, so when phi is an interacting field, um, you can include those sort of perturbatively. So this formula, you, you have to add to this um, an infinite series of terms. Uh, not, in all, not in all cases does it converge. Um, so this is one of the problems with this that I'll get to. Um, yeah, so this is a free field 
guy, uh, and it also depends on the particular background we're talking about. So this would, so this is best understood in vacuum ADS. So this would be uh, an exact operator equation for the free field case in a limit where where phi, uh, you can ignore the back reaction to phi. So it, if you could if you could exactly ignore the back reaction to phi, then this would be an exact operator equation. But if you try to insert too many. Um, uh, then all of these excitations will back react, the geometry will change, and then um, for very different geometries, you're supposed to use a different K. So, so then this would no longer hold. So it's sort of in an approximation where you're, uh, you're really talking about this semi-classical limit where this is an operator equation. So, uh, what will fail will be like the linearity of this... Uh... Because this is like yeah. a general ansatz. If yeah. you change the green function, you... right? What will fail is that. Um, yeah, you might be able to to word it like the linearity. Uh, it, this would definitely. It's this guy should change, and he definitely does change on different backgrounds. Um, yeah. So, in the limit that phi doesn't back react then this would say the same, and then it would be, um, yeah, then it would be fine. But yeah, it's, yeah, there's some linearity issue otherwise. Yeah. So uh, one thing I want to mention about this guy is that even though we've written in this equation phi in terms of some big integral over CFT operators that don't live on just one time slice of the CFT, but are actually, you know, in some time band, you actually only need a time slice. Uh, and, and the reason is that this is not special to ADS CFT, it's just a you know statement. In any QFT or any quantum mechanical system, By, so let's say this is some time slice down here. This is some operator O inserted at some point x uh, at some future time t. So let's say this is t equals zero. Um, you can represent. You can write this operator as some fairly complicated operator acting at this earlier time, uh, and it'll have support. Yeah, some non-trivial, fairly complicated support. Uh, at the intersection of this time slice and uh, the past light cone, and it's essentially this operator if you're acting it here. So th this O of x0 is some operator acting on this time slice, and this H is, some, is the Hamiltonian governing your quantum system. Uh, so it's, it's this relatively complicated operator that you can act at t equals 0, which will implement this operator at a later time. So <laughs> conversely, if I have this operator here, say in this formula, so that some of these O of x's are acting not at t equals zero, but say at some later or earlier time, I can replace them with operators acting just at t equals zero, um, albeit slightly more complicated looking operators. <laughs> so instead of being local like these guys, there'll be some uh, sort of smeared out mess, but it's something you can in principle do so the idea is um, if you just evolve each of those O's to t equals zero using the CFT Hamiltonian, we have this um, bulk field phi at point x. Oops. Um, you know, it's future light cone. It hit the boundary. Uh, here and here, so, that, so this region S of X is you know, this big time band, but we can represent this phi using this method on just this T equals zero slice, which I'll draw in green. Or any other slice we want. But you know, we can in particular represent this operator as some operator on this time slice. Uh, the reason I'm saying this is that that's just a convenient way to think about you know, we're mapping 
some operator that's living roughly on one time slice of the bulk to some operator living roughly on one time slice of the CFT. That's sort of a nicer um, relationship to think about than mapping it to something that's more smeared out in time. Um, these are the pictures I'm going to draw later. It's this mapping from one time, place, from an operator at one time to an operator at another time. And let me now ask the question, great, now that we can do this, we can talk about reconstructing <clears throat> at least some operators uh, deep in the bulk as some operator in the CFT with a fairly explicit formula, at least in some cases. Uh, is this everything we want? And I'm going to tell you, not really. And let me argue why. So the reason it's not really everything we want is that it doesn't appear that such green fun Green's function solutions generally exist. Uh, for example, for geometries that are far from vacuum ADS. So HKLL really figured out how to do it around vacuum ADS, but when there's a lot of back reaction or you're even just doing it around some different backgrounds, like when there's a black hole, they don't always exist. And there's a nice picture for this. This is related to the question uh, we were asking earlier. So I'm going to draw the black hole pinners diagram. So yeah, I, I don't know if I ever made it explicit, but these curvy lines in the, the top and the bottom are the singularities of the black hole, and inside these diagonal lines is the interior of the diagonal lines of the horizon. And so if you try and do this Green's function method, the, uh, for some operator here, we run into trouble. So the reason is that essentially you just followed the same algorithm. You would try and evolve, you know, you'd, you'd evolve this operator phi out radially. And uh, you would hit the singularity. So you know, there's some, some data that you need to reconstruct, to write this phi at some further out point, but that data is data that's supposed to live at the singularity, uh, which is a problem. You know, this, this doesn't allow us to use CFT data to write this phi because some of the data we need isn't in the CFT. It's whatever is at the singularity. Uh, it's just a problem. We just can't, in this situation, write this phi using this method as a boundary operator. So solving the equations radially hits the singularity, no good. So, and this is sort of exactly the situation that I am most interested in, is understanding what's going on inside black holes. So the fact that this method doesn't allow us to do that, I view as a big shortcoming. Uh, let me now directly address the question that you're asking. Um, before I move on from HKLL reconstruction to what is a more powerful in general type, um, let me mention one thing, which is called uh, Rendler reconstruction. I think that was the name. So it's a different type of, uh, you know, it's, it's in the same papers by HKLL. And it's a, it just uses the fact that this kernel here, this K, wasn't unique. There, was, there were different ones you could choose. And um, some of them, allowed you to reconstruct phi in the CFT not using, say, an entire spatial slice, but just using a subregion of the CFT. And this is very important because it's going to be like the types of reconstruction we talk about afterwards. So let me emphasize this. So here again, I'm drawing the same 
sort of CF, uh, ADS diagram, where I have the same uh, 5x that I'm trying to write as a boundary operator. And before, we argued that there was some formula like this that allowed you to reconstruct this phi using the whole time, some, some like t equals zero slice, so some operator in, with support on the entire time slice of the boundary. Turns out that when you're solving the equations radially, at, you know, this is the, the sort of slogany way of talking about using this Green's function solution to write phi as a boundary operator. You don't have to solve it radially in all directions. You can sort of try and concentrate in one direction and uh, this sort of works. So you, know, you can just sort of solve it this way. And what you get is that um, you need not land with this integral supported, or with this k, say, having support on all boundary x. It can have just supports on uh, subregion. Let's see, how do I draw this? Uh, it'll be easier if I say it this way. So let's say, let's say I pick some subregion B of the boundary. So I, there's some time slice. This is some circle on the, on the boundary of the cylinder. And I'm picking a subregion of that circle that I'm calling B. It's this, this solid subregion. And now if you find the domain of dependence of this B, in the CFT, so that this is like you, you consider it's uh, the, the space-time region that uh, it knows all the data about. So you know this is like if you found its, um, it would look like a diamond. I don't know how, to, yeah, how do you draw it? It's like uh, something like this. And this is like if you just consider, yeah, it's called the domain of dependence where you basically chop out the causal future and past of the complementary region. So this is some uh, patch of the boundary cylinder. You take this whole patch of the boundary, and now you look at its bulk past and future. Um, this creates what's called the causal wedge. It's not super important. Um, I say that it like create. You know, the bulk past and future intersect at some line, which I'm drawing here is this green line. Um, that defines something called the causal wedge. The details won't be super important, and I'm happy to go into more detail about how this thing is defined. The statement of Rindler reconstruction is that any, any uh, point or any local operator in this causal wedge, this is the bulk region, admits a reconstruction just, uh, just on B. So there's some formula here where the support is not on the whole region S sub X that I defined, but instead just on this patch of the boundary uh, here. And you know, just like before, you can take any operator in this patch and then uh, evolve it to be some fairly complicated operator that lives just on this one time slice that we were calling B. So 5x admits reconstruction on just a subregion of the CFT. So this is a, an example of subregion reconstruction. I think I maybe went fast on that explanation. Let me give you an example that maybe makes it clearer. So if you consider this black hole case, I, gave, I, I said there was a problem trying to reconstruct this operator phi inserted here inside the black hole because when you solve the equations radially, you hit the singularity. And so you can't define all the boundary data you need to reconstruct by that. You might complain that if I just define some operator here, which is outside the black hole, uh, so this will be phi acting at some point x prime, 
this is outside the black hole, and it would seem to have the same problem as this guy if I use that formula, right? Because his, his past and future look something like this. And so while his, you know, he has support on some uh, finite time band of the right CFT, part of the data we need, the part to the left, seems, uh, seems to be at the singularity on the left side. That's his past and future hitting the singularity on this side. That's, so that would seem to say you couldn't reconstruct this operator uh, in this background using HKLL reconstruction. But actually you can. The way out is you have to just remember that you can do Rindler reconstruction with a different kernel. Not that one, but the one that just has support uh, on a patch of the boundary. And in this case, uh, it only, you only need for anything in the, the right exterior so outside the black hole here to the right, you can use just this right CFT <coughs> to reconstruct it. So you can just solve the equations for phi radially outwards this way. Um, it has support on just this finite time band here. You don't need this left side. So maybe that's an illustration to you of the power and importance of this idea of Rindler reconstruction. So you can just use a patch of the boundary <coughs> with these methods. Yeah. So, um, does this um, does this uh, reconstruction procedure give some problems with the uh, non-uniqueness of the region that you can pick? Yes, absolutely, absolutely does. Um, which is exactly what I'm going to talk about next lecture. Um, so, to tell everyone what was just pointed out, um, right? So, here I said you can sort of choose to solve represent phi as some operator on some boundary subregion B. Uh, but it's not unique what that B is. This is actually not just a, a little toy curiosity. It's very deep. It's a deep statement about the ADS CFT dictionary, which we will discuss in detail next time. Um, but for now, this is what I wanted to say about Renly reconstruction. And um, So before I close, let me give you a taste of where we're going. So we, we introduced the extrapolate dictionary, and we said, this is great. This is the fundamental, you know, in some sense, fundamentally defining the dictionary. But it's not telling us everything we want to know, like about the inside of black holes. Um, HKLL does a little better. It allows you, in some cases, to reconstruct operators further in the bulk, but still doesn't do everything we want because it doesn't reach all the way in to the interior. You could ask, is there a better scheme that does allow you to, say, reach further in or reconstruct operators behind black hole horizons? And we would like to do better than just guess at some reconstruction scheme and then check how good it is. We would like to be systematic about it and prove some theorems about what can, in principle, be reconstructed using what data of the CFT. You know, we, we want to know, like, prove a theorem. Is there any way of writing a CFT operator that reconstructs this guy? And maybe, if so, what is it? And in the last few years, that's exactly the sort of theorem we've been able to write down. So we can prove statements that sort of systematically tell us what is and isn't possible. Uh, it will be possible in, case, in some cases to reconstruct operators like this. Um, uh, in, and when this is and isn't possible is very deep and important related to the information problem. I want to talk about all of this. Um, but good. So we want to turn from this, which is sort of uh, like pre-2015, to the post-2015 paradigm of uh, reconstruction schemes that work as generally as possible with certain theoretical guarantees. And what I will tell you about next time is going to start with the so-called 
quantum extremal surface prescription. quantum extremal surface formula. And Q, this will often, I'll just call it the QES formula, the QES prescription. And um, I'll tell you what it is. It's a prescription that was written down as um, not originally with the goal in mind of understanding bulk reconstruction. It was written down originally as a tool for computing the von Neumann entropy of CFD subregions. And it just turns out, people figured out, that it is perhaps the most insightful formula that exists for telling you uh, what you can and can't reconstruct. And um, explaining it and explaining how people started to see that it was very useful for understanding bulk reconstruction will be the topic of next lecture. Thank you. So we have a few minutes for questions before the discussion. I mean, the discussion will be after the second lecture of the afternoon. Uh, I was wondering, is there also some Euclidean version of this reconstruction problem, or maybe it's not interesting, or it's too trivial? Uh, or... Yeah. Um, there, yeah, definitely. Um, it's not one that I've thought about as much. Uh, there should be a way to... Yeah, I'm sure a lot of similar things can be said. Like, you can certainly do a version of HKLL reconstruction and actually uh, I guess one thing that I would wonder is um, in the Euclidean setting, what are the questions we're trying to answer? There, I'm sure there are some. Uh, I guess it's in this Lorentzian setting where we can ask things like, what's going on behind this horizon? Um, which is why I have mostly focused on that. But I, yeah, there should be some sort of color. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah, maybe um, even as a comment on the, the question, I, I mean, I think you already said this, but of course in the Euclidean there will be no interior. And I think at least at the classical level, which probably extends the, the problem is essentially solved by Pfeffer and Graham in the mathematical sense, right? But, yeah, but that, that, was, that was just yeah. a quick comment. My question was actually with this um, time slice thing. Uh, vague question, sorry. Um, is there some in inter interplay with this idea of complexity in the sense that time evolution uh, generates complexity and somehow there is the law that very complex operators are hard to reconstruct? So maybe if you wait too long in the future, you still run into trouble? Yeah, great. Yeah, so um, that's certainly true. Uh, yeah, so at some level, this operator, I, I was saying, yeah as you're remarking on, is nasty when you time all it back and try to represent it here. Um, but there's a sort of formal, another definition, a more formal definition of complexity <clears throat> that you could give where uh, if this t was too long, like this, uh, this local operator was, say, some, uh, so far in the future it was exponential in some parameter, then it would literally be probably formally complex to write it in. The operator you wrote here would be formally complex to act um, have high complexity in the computer science sense. Uh, this is true. Um, yeah, it is related to some things that people are talking about these days with like Python's lunches and so on, with uh, how hard it is to reconstruct operators behind the horizon. So let me hijack the answer to this question to also emphasize a point that I didn't say, which is, one thing I'm focusing on in these lectures is this question of, is it possible to reconstruct some given operator in, uh, in some, say, portion of the CFT? And I am uh, not going to really discuss the question of how hard is it to reconstruct? Like, you know, given that you can reconstruct it, how 
complicated in the computer science sense is uh, that reconstruction. Although that is a very interesting question and it seems to be the case that oftentimes operators behind the horizon um, can be very complicated to reconstruct, say, uh, using some patch of the CFT or some patch of the Hawking radiation. And, uh, that is deeply related to this, yeah. Okay, I think uh, we should, oh, yeah, that. Yeah, just uh, super short. You say it's like, can be complicated in a computer theoretic sense, but is it, do we know if it's complicated in a physics sense? Like, is there been any progress on someone writing down something like HKL that you can actually use practically to yeah, compute good. So, correlators in the interior or something? Yeah, so, um, yes, I will mention at some point the formulas we have that do the explicit reconstruction. So, so one formula that essentially should work any time anything could possibly work. It's called the PETS reconstruction formula. And uh, this is a, a fairly explicit formula and you know, in certain examples like this um, so-called West Coast replica wormholes paper that some of you might be familiar with, they actually, you know, explicitly talk about, they're able to like, you know, do this calculation, do the reconstruction explicitly, they can, they can compute exactly how well it reconstructs the operator, because there's always some error, I haven't mentioned that yet, but, you know, um, when you reconstruct the operator, it might do a, a great job, but not exact, not, not exactly reconstructed, and you can compute how well these formulas <coughs> do, and um, so in this physics sense of reconstruction, there is some understanding of what the formulas look like for reconstructing these things that have even been implemented in certain cases. In general, it's very difficult and looks very ugly. And in general, it won't look like some nice uh, integral with some kernel times some local operator. There's actually a good argument why the more powerful types of reconstruction that we're gonna talk about, given to you by the PETS map, and guaranteed to work by this, don't look like that and they can't. And I, I will be happy to mention why that is. Um, they're generally more complicated. Okay, let's uh, postpone the question to the discussion and uh, don't leave, we have the picture now, so just come all in front and look at the back. Uh, let's thank Chris uh, for the lecture. And <laughs> so, after, after the picture,